Welcome to the News Hour. The White House says President Biden is considering options to strike back against the Iran-backed militia that killed three American soldiers in Jordan yesterday. From Yemen to Iraq to Syria and now Jordan, American forces are engaging Iranian-supported groups across the region. Nick Schifrin starts our coverage. It's in a remote desert corner at the intersection of three countries, and the attack on Tower 22 today led to a U.S. vow of revenge. The president and I will not tolerate attack on U.S. forces, and we will take all necessary actions to defend the U.S. and our troops. We will respond decisively to any aggression, and we will hold responsible the people who attacked our troops. U.S. military and defense officials say an Iranian-backed militia fired a single explosive drone that landed in soldiers' barracks and got through the base's air defense because it was misidentified as a U.S. drone. The three soldiers killed were U.S. Army Reservist Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, and Specialist Brianna Moffett. Bases in Iraq and Syria have been targeted repeatedly since mid-October, but this weekend's was the first in Jordan. Tower 22 is located on the Jordan side of a remote demilitarized zone where Jordan, Iraq, and Syria meet. To the north is the U.S. Al-Tanf garrison in Syria. It relies on Tower 22 for logistics and other support. For years, Al-Tanf has functioned as a launching point for special forces combating ISIS militants and monitors a weapon shipping route along a highway leading into Baghdad. The base has been the target of previous strikes by Iranian-backed militias. It's also right next to the vast Rukban refugee camp. At its peak, more than 100,000 internally displaced Syrians were crowded there, seeking refuge from ISIS, but blocked by Jordan from crossing the border. We do not seek another war. We do not seek to escalate. At the White House today, National Security Spokesman John Kirby said the U.S. will respond in a way that does not escalate, but acknowledges Iran's role. We'll do that on our schedule, in our time, and we'll do it in the manner of the president's choosing as commander-in-chief. We'll also do it fully cognizant of the fact that these groups, backed by Tehran, have just taken the lives of American troops. Iran's foreign ministry today said militia groups act on their own. The Islamic Republic of Iran does not interfere in the decisions of the resistance groups on how to support the Palestinian nation or defend themselves and their people against any aggression and occupation. And Nick Schifrin joins us now. So, Nick, what is the administration weighing as it considers its response? U.S. officials obviously won't telegraph uh, the punch, uh, as, as they put it. Uh, but uh, until this weekend, they have been uh, very selective. In Iraq and Syria, they've responded to the 150-plus attacks before this weekend by going after things like uh, weapons storage facilities, missiles, drones, factories. They've tried to calibrate it so that they don't actually kill members of the militia so as, in their words, not to escalate. Same in Yemen. The targets uh, over about 10 rounds of U.S. and U.K. strikes have again been missiles and drones that the, Houthi, the Houthis have been using to fire at ships and not trying to attack Houthi command and control with senior Houthi leadership. But this is uh, a different size of attack, as you said and as the package said, uh, and the U.S. response is likely to be larger. And there are critics of the administration out today saying it must be much larger. Uh, we heard from Senator Roger Wicker, the ranking member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. He wants to see a strike directly at, quote, Iranian targets and its leadership. Uh, Mike Rogers, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Republican uh, criticized President Biden, saying his fear of escalation has morphed into the doctrine of appeasement. So there is this argument that says the administration must go a lot farther, but the administration officials I talked to say exactly what you heard just John mm -hmm. Kirby say, look, we do not want this to turn into a regional war. Therefore, we will continue to try and calibrate our response so it doesn't escalate further. On another matter, Nick, we know that the CIA director, Bill Burns, met over the weekend with his Israeli and Egyptian counterparts in a meeting that was mediated by Qatar. What, what came of that meeting? They were talking about a hostage deal. Right, right. So this is about releasing hostages held by Hamas in Gaza in exchange for stopping the war, at least temporarily. And that group that you just laid out has been an effective one. They're the ones who brought about the November ceasefire that led to the release of more than 100 hostages. These are four men who have met many times uh, 
before there you see uh, Bill Burns on the left, the Qatari prime minister, uh, and the uh, Israeli and Egyptian intelligence chiefs. Uh, now, and they believe that they have made progress. And the progress is that they have an outline that they believe Israel accepts uh, that would allow for the release of women and children for, and in exchange for a certain amount of time for a ceasefire. Uh, officials won't give the exact details. And then that round would essentially lead to a second round of more releases. And then the final round would be uh, Israeli soldiers and dead bodies. And again, what U.S. officials hope is that if they can make progress on that deal, which is a temporary ceasefire for the release of hostages as well as the release of Palestinians detained in Israel, that could lead to a more permanent ceasefire and what the U.S. is really hoping for, progress uh, across the region, namely normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia and steps toward a two-state hmm. solution for the Palestinians. So more to come on that front. Meantime, the U.N. agency that delivers aid to Gaza stands accused of being infiltrated by Hamas. As I understand it, Israel has created a dossier about that. What does it say? Yeah, the dossier was attained by PBS NewsHour, uh, and uh, it's quite damning about UNRWA. Uh, it says that 13 UNRWA staffers in total were involved in October the 7th, and you see there four UNRWA staff were involved in kidnapping on October the 7th, six UNRWA staff infiltrated into Israel. Uh, it also says Hamas fighters have used UNRWA facilities as hideouts to conceal weapons within UNRWA equipment. Uh, and there's also longer term uh, collaboration between UNRWA and Hamas in this dossier. Uh, Hamas built tunnels under the headquarters of UNRWA, under an UNRWA school, uh, and that in total 10% of all of UNRWA uh, is actually Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, another militant group that is about 1,200 of 13,000 people. But here's the problem. UNRWA is the only game in town when it comes to delivering humanitarian aid. The U.S. has stopped humanitarian assistance, sorry, has stopped funding for UNRWA temporarily, but U.S. and quietly Israeli officials are acknowledging, you see how much UNRWA does right there, these tent cities, all of the medical help that Gazans need right now, the freezing of funding, Jeff, is expected to be temporary, and U.S. officials are trying to make sure that it's as short as possible so that UNRWA uh, activities are actually not stopped. Nick Schifrin, thank you for that reporting and for unpacking all of those developments. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff.